Uh, we're delighted today to um, host Minister for Africa Mark Simmons uh, to talk about the upcoming London conference on Somalia. Uh, Mr. Simmons was a, an elected MP for Boston and Skegness. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I tend to mangle these British uh, in Lincolnshire, uh, elected in 2001. Uh, he was appointed uh, just last September as Parliamentary Under Secretary of State in the Foreign of Commonwealth Office um, and if for Africa, uh, the Africa portfolio and British overseas territories. And uh, he's currently tasked with coordinating uh, the May 7th uh, conference, um, which is the second annual London conference on Somalia, looking at how best the, United, uh, the international community can support reconstruction there. Um, I think we all know this is a moment of uh, tremendous opportunity in Somalia. It's a new government that has considerable goodwill. Um, it's staked out a real uh, vision and commitment to improve security and justice, corruption, uh, reduce corruption, stimulate economic growth, and deliver services, health, and education. Um, Al-Shabaab is still a threat, as we've seen from uh, events in the last week, uh, but it is on its back foot. Uh, and pushed out of the major towns. I think uh, we hosted uh, President Sheikh Hassan here um, in January, and uh, we had just a massive crowd of Americans, of Somalis from all over the U.S., um, and you really got the sense that, you know, we've had windows of opportunity before, but I think you really got at this time a sense of opportunity and hope and possibility to turn things. Uh, around. Uh, that was right on the aftermath of the restoration of diplomatic uh, relations. So it was really a very upbeat event, and uh, you rarely have gotten those in the last 20 years on Somalia, unfortunately. Um, there are big challenges ahead. Um, you know, the President is very aware of those, just extremely low levels of capacity, you know, tasked with rebuilding a system that is completely dysfunctional this very divided country where there's lots of mistrust of authority and federal authority, security sector, and so forth. The big, you know, the big problems, I mean, overarching problems to my mind are, and, and he laid these out as well, are there are so many priorities that you risk having nothing be a priority when you've got just a huge laundry list. And so the sequencing and the prioritization within the many things that need to be get, get done is so important. Uh, the public expectation of change, and uh, uh, I think the new government has a very short period in which to make changes and, and demonstrate <coughs> demonstrate uh, kind of its goodwill and its capacity to do these things. And then such an overwhelming dependence on external funding, uh, which makes it difficult for the state as it's trying to reassert its authority and sovereignty, um, uh, that it's got to be answerable to the Somali people, but at the same time, it's got donors who may have slightly different priorities or perspectives, and it's going to be interesting to hear from you, um, you know, where some of those uh, areas might be and what's the space for negotiation and compromise. And then I think related to that, uh, and this will be very much on people's minds, is how the international community avoids kind of creating, even with well-intended support, distortions and in incentives and so forth, and how does it, how does it set benchmarks and kind of transparency uh, and avoid creating new vested interests that become problematic down the line. Um, so you've got a big challenge, <laughs> having been in the job about six months now. Um, we're looking forward to your remarks, and we'll keep it interactive, so we'll have questions and answers at the end, um, uh, uh, in which people can offer their comments, recommendations, and Welcome, and thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction, uh, and it's very good to be here in Washington uh, at CSIS. Uh, my constituency in the United Kingdom is uh, Boston and Skegness, and uh, I, uh, my, it is the original Boston. <laughs> so I have uh, pleasure coming to uh, Boston, Massachusetts, describing it as New Boston, which of course not everybody from Boston uh, thinks is amusing. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I was delighted to be, uh, to be asked to be here uh, to share with you um, the British government's perspective on Somalia um, with so many respected experts on Africa. Uh, and I very much hope that there are some uh, Somalis following this particular discussion we're going to have 
this morning. And as Jennifer, as you quite rightly pointed out, uh, President Hassan Sheikh addressed in this room uh, in January at a very historic moment when the United States had formally recognized Somalia as a sovereign partner for the first time in, I think, approximately 20 years. And last week, the International Monetary Fund followed suit, and this opens the door for significant support. And just a few months into his appointment, President Hassan gave an inspiring presentation of his personal vision of the future of Somalia. He talked about a time when all Somalis living at home and overseas would have a chance to make a contribution to their society's well-being. And about a time when Somali children would be able to attend school and grow up to the, be the champions of peace in the future. He has also set out his government's six-pillar plan that seeks to achieve this by rebuilding state institutions and civil structures so long absent from Somali society. And if I can just give you a feel for the challenge that the president and his government is facing. When I first met the president in Mogadishu back in October last year, he informed me that there wasn't one person living in Somalia at that time who had ever worked in a government department. So they are fundamentally building state structures from scratch, a huge and significant challenge that requires all of our uh, support, both moral and otherwise. Now, three months on from uh, the President's talk here, I want to talk today about the international community and how we have lined up behind the priorities that were set out by the President. And I want to talk about the focus that the world leaders are bringing to Somalia and how 2013 is going to be a real turning point in Somalia's history. As you all know, it's uh, emerging from two decades of conflict. Its people have suffered from truly desperate levels of violence, poverty, and hunger. And I think this was evidenced in 2011, when Somalia was the only country in the Horn of Africa where a bad drought turned into a famine. And even when that famine subsided in February last year, more than two million people in Somalia remained in need. And out of a population of 10 million, that's about one in five. Very significant numbers. Now, to rebuild a country from such extreme poverty and collapse seems on the face of it unthinkable and a huge challenge. But remarkably, the people of Somalia, I think, have embraced this challenge and start to look for a new future. But the president and his government is very aware of the challenges that they face. And he also said to me, as I think quite a stark anecdote, that he realized the challenge that he was facing as he was walking through uh, Mogadishu and saw a young girl wrapped in a Somali flag very shortly after he was selected as the president, which drove home to him the enormous expectation of the Somali people for the change that and the progress that has been made. Now, the very positive start was the way in which the president was selected, the most representative in decades. It was Somali-owned. It was Somali-led. And for the first time in decades, the Somali president and its parliament were selected inside Somalia, with the Somali people being consulted through their traditional elders. And the president and the subsequently appointed government ministers have committed to improving, rightly, justice and security, delivering health care and education, reducing corruption, and stimulating economic recovery. They've also committed to upholding the unity and integrity of Somalia, bringing together the regions. And Parliament has agreed a timetable for revising the Somali constitution ahead of an eventual referendum. But importantly, alongside these political developments, Somalis have also seen security improve. Somali national security forces and an expanded African Union mission in Somalia have expelled al-Shabaab from many of Somalia's major towns and cities. People are rebuilding their properties and businesses. Confidence is increasing and the economy is starting to revive. And very importantly, the diaspora is starting to return. 
people living in Mogadishu, Kismayo, Badoa, are looking forward to seeing tangible improvements to their daily lives, and they're finally able to imagine a future for their children which is free from the threats of terrorism, piracy, and the scourge of famine. However, I think I need to just emphasize that how easily these gains might be overturned. The progress over the last 12 months or so is real, but the progress is nonetheless fragile. And to imagine that these threats have gone away or the hard work is behind us would be a mistake. But I do very strongly believe that 2013 is the best opportunity in many decades for progress to be embedded in Somalia. The Somali government is committed to working with international partners to build on this progress, and the international community stands ready to work with Somalia to seize that opportunity, taking its lead from the President's call for a paradigm shift in Somalia's relations with its friends and neighbours to one of partnership. Now, this year, there will be many occasions for international partners to support Somalia, including the G8 meetings, the Tokyo International Conference on African Development in early June, the EU-hosted conference in September on the New Deal for Fragile States. But the UK government's immediate priority and immediate focus is on the conference in London on the 7th of May, which will be co-chaired between the federal government of Somalia and the British government, where over 50 countries and organisations will commit to support the federal government's key priorities. And as Jennifer absolutely rightly highlighted, the importance of forensic focus on key priorities so that we can actually have some deliverable outcomes rather than trying to paint on too broad a canvas. So I just thought I might make a few remarks on what the principal objectives and priorities <coughs> will be. The first is for the Somali government to share its plans for developing the country's armed forces, police, justice and public financial management systems. The second for the Somali government to set out plans to promote dialogue, generate trust and discuss the future structure of Somalia with the Somalia regions. And thirdly, for the international community to agree how it will support the implementation of those plans. And if I may, I'd just like to explore in a little more detail, focusing on three major themes. Firstly, security, increasing Somali capacity and underpinning Amazon. Secondly, justice, rebuilding the judiciary and police service. And thirdly, the economy, strengthening public financial management and promoting trade, investment and engagement. And in each of these key areas, the government of Somalia has been working to put plans in place and our hope is that the conference can endorse these plans and agree, agree a coordinated international approach to support them. And if I could just take each in turn. Firstly, security. I was in um, Uganda and Ethiopia two weeks ago and had a chance to meet some of the Amazon troops who are putting their lives on the line so that the people of Somalia can go about their daily lives in safety and security. And in what, without the extremely valuable job done by Amazon, often in very difficult circumstances, and without the support of the troop-contributing countries, progress to date would not have been possible. And we do owe a significant debt of gratitude to the troop-contributing countries and to the African Union for their efforts. But President Hassan is right to say that Somalia ultimately needs to be in control of its own security. To achieve this, legitimate and effective national security forces have to be developed with clear accountability and civilian oversight. Only then will they be able to fulfil their role in preserving public order, protecting people and property. The armed forces will be an important part of this alongside police and Coast Guard. Partners are, of course, already providing support to build the capacity for Somali armed forces, noted to be via US training programs and through the EU training mission in Somalia. On the justice side, secondly, justice, there is an urgent need to increase citizens' access 
to justice in newly liberated areas. At the same time, there is a need to begin to establish an independent judiciary and wider justice system capable of delivering justice for all. This is critical for the future stability of the country, long-term development and security. And it is particularly important to the large numbers of women who need to be able to access appropriate justice in cases of domestic and sexual violence. The new Somali government has developed a two-year action plan. This both addresses the immediate needs and seeks to develop the key justice institutions in order to increase access to and improve the quality of justice for Somali citizens. Building a capable and accountable Somali peace for police force is also a key part of the agenda to establish civilian rule of law and protection for the most vulnerable. There is a need to rebuild policing capacity in areas liberated from al-Shabaab control and start laying the foundations for an effective and modern civilian police force. And the Somali Ministry for the Interior and National Security has conducted a review of policing and produced a new four-year strategic action plan. And finally and thirdly, the economy. The President has rightly emphasised repeatedly the importance of well-managed, transparent public finances. This would allow the Somali government to begin to pay salaries to security forces and civil servants, to deliver services to the Somali public. In turn, this would reinforce the government's credibility and legitimacy, and ultimately would pave the way for arrears clearance and the re-engagement of the international financial institutions. The Somali government has developed a public financial management reform plan and progress is well underway. But this should not be looked at in isolation. It should be seen alongside the work the UK has been pursuing on Somalia through our presidency of the G8. We have focused here on encouraging the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the IMF to re-engage in Somalia to support its long-term economic stability and growth. Somalia owes $700 million to these institutions and has a total debt of over $3 billion. But the Somali government has shown determination to manage its public finances credibly, strengthen financial uh, transparency and increase accountability. And at the G8 foreign ministers meeting agreed earlier this month was to provide high-level political support to that process of re-engagement U.S. recognition of the federal government of Somalia back in January and the more recent IMF decision to do the same are small but very uh, significant steps on this path, One which, ones which could secure the expertise and support of the international financial institutions to help implement reforms which would promote long-term stability and growth in Somalia and also ensure that the international donor community has confidence that money coming from the respective taxpayers in the developed world is spent for the purpose for which it was intended. So in all of these important areas, security, justice and the economy, the Somali government has been working to get plans in place. But support will be needed from international partners to deliver activities set out in the plan. Now we've also organised alongside the Somali government a number of events in the run-up to the conference and immediately after the conference, which will allow other important issues to be explored in greater detail, including working with the diaspora and civil society. And I myself have spent some time consulting with the Somali and Somaliland diaspora that lives in the United Kingdom. The first thing we're going to do is arrange a women's event in the United Kingdom, which I will co-chair with our Secretary of State for International Development early next week, which will feed into the conference, focusing on women's empowerment, preventing sexual violence, forced marriage and female genital mutilation. Somalia is one of the most difficult places in the world to be a woman. The federal government has committed to improving women's lives, combating sexual violence against women and children, and challenging the culture of impunity surrounding these crimes. And the challenge will be transforming this commitment into action and reality on the ground. The recent G8 meeting in London also saw a historic declaration that rape and sexual violence in conflict constitute a breach of the Geneva Convention. 
and to support the federal government of Somalia in this challenge. Uh, the UN Secretary General's Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, conflict uh, Zeneb Bangura, visited Somalia at the start of April. And her office is now arranging for a team of experts to visit in the summer to work with the government to review existing justice and support structures, particularly for victims of sexual violence. And they will uh, report back uh, shortly after that. But whilst the security sector and the crimes of the past must not be forgotten. We must also make sure that we're not just demonstrating to wor the world the challenges and the problems that Somalia faces, but also the significant opportunities and the bright future that exists. So a Somalia of hope, of enterprise, and of aspiration. And that is why, on the 8th of May, I will be chairing a trade and investment conference uh, immediately after the day after the main Somalia conference to highlight the business opportunities that exist, to promote inward investment, including, importantly, the involvement of the Somali diaspora and creating much stronger links between the Somali diaspora outside Somalia and the opportunities that exist within. So it will be a significant opportunity to connect investors, explore the ways we can remove the barriers to business, how we can overcome those barriers. And I very much hope it will give the public and businesses a different perspective and different view of Somalia, which is all too often looked at through the prism of the challenges that we were talking about earlier. And if I can just give you one simple example. Um, when I visited Mogadishu last uh, Oct October, there is significant fish stocks off the coast of Somalia. Uh, unless this fish is sold by midday, by the time the midday sun rises, most of it has to be thrown back into the sea because it's going off. There was no refrigeration facilities. Just down the coast in Mozambique, Mozambican fishermen are catching prawns. They're frozen on the dockside, and within 36 hours, they're being sold in British supermarkets. With investment, with determination, and with involvement of the Somali diaspora, we too could put in place that sort of facility for the benefit of the Somali people. But I wonder how many people outside this room are aware of the long tradition of Somali enterprise and innovation. How many people know that despite the challenging circumstances in which they operate, Somali businesses are thriving and new opportunities are emerging, driven in large part by the diaspora? And I think the international community has a moral obligation to ensure that we tap into that entrepreneurial flair. It may, as, may come as some surprise to learn that Somalia has one of the most advanced mobile telephone networks in Africa, the cheapest mobile phone tariff in the world, even has sophisticated mobile banking. And I hope that this event will make clear that the spirit of Somali entrepreneurship continues to run strong. Now, they're the main themes of the 7th of May conference, and I hope that it's given you some sense of how the event and the others occurring later in the year will focus international support around the clear priorities set out by the president and his government. And in doing so, the international community has recognized that there is an opportunity in 2013 which must be seized if Somalia is to build on the remarkable progress that has recently been made. And I very much hope in years to come, we will look back and see this year as a clear turning point in Somalia's history. But we mustn't miss this opportunity. So I would finally say, we must make sure that we maintain our energy levels. We must ensure there is international cooperation and international coordination to drive security, to drive stability, to drive economic development, economic growth, and sustainable job creation to enable Somalia to return to the family of stable nation states. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that, and, uh, and, and really for, again, highlighting kind of the upside that we have here. Yeah, you're welcome to take a seat. Um, particularly interesting to see what will come out of that May 8th session, which is uh, very exciting in the business, the business investment. 
Um, so we'll be looking, looking forward to that. Um, we'll open it up for questions. I wanted to start maybe, um, I know you've met recently with the president of Somaliland, I believe. Is that, uh, I and I wonder if you can say a little bit about kind of the, some of the sub-national authorities and, and how, how they're viewing this and how you're viewing them and how the Somali government is, is, is viewing them and their role in this reconstruction. I mean, I imagine there's some tensions there as well. Yes, I'm gonna, I mean, I don't. Uh, at, uh, at Chevening, um, just before the first Somali conference last year, a meeting between the, uh, the then uh, interim government uh, of Somalia and the Somaliland government. Uh, there was a, a positive meeting between the two presidents that took place in Ankara recently. And certainly there needs to be an establishment and an understanding uh, of the relationship that will exist between the federal government and Somaliland. And our uh, emphasis has initially been on trying to persuade the two, uh, the two uh, governments to focus on areas where they have particular, particular mutual interest, so to build trust and an empathy to start with. And certainly the two most obvious uh, of those are security and stability and economic and trade ties. Uh, and we have again offered uh, to... Uh, if it would help to facilitate an engagement between uh, the two respective presidents. But it is challenging. But for the future long-term stability of Somalia, there needs to be uh, an agreement reached as to the constitutional uh, links between the disparate parts of Somalia. Let's open up for some questions. Let's see. We have, um, we have about 30 minutes, 25 minutes. We'll start with Deirdre. And if you can or just suggestions. Yes, suggestions, comments as well. Okay. And uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, right. Uh, my name is Deirdre Lupin. I am a senior associate at the Africa Center, University of Pennsylvania. I was also posted to Somalia uh, before I was evacuated in 1990 for UNICEF. So I've served there for three and a half years. And the elephant in the room when one talks about economy in Somalia that doesn't seem to get mentioned, but which is very much an issue, is oil production in the, the northeastern part of the country. Uh, there have been fines. Uh, they haven't been developed, but there are blocks that are owned and so on. And how, uh, what is the potential future of these blocks and how might that play into the national, subnational tensions that were just mentioned? Yeah, let's take a few at a time. Uh, we'll go with Mark in the back row, and then we'll, and then we'll come over. Right, thanks. I'm uh, Mark Yarnell with Refugees International uh, and cover Somalia. Um, I absolutely appreciate the um, emphasis on the opportunities that are ahead, but but also appreciate the uh, recognition of the, the existing fragility as it exists on the ground now. And I guess one thing specifically I'm curious to know your thoughts on is in a place like, uh, like Baidoa, um, which has increased stability and there's there's incremental returns of IDPs and refugees, um, but at the same time, there's, uh, you know, it's becoming more apparent that Ethiopia is not going to stick around for too much longer. And given the resources that Amazon have, there's a lot of concern about what will happen, given what we saw in uh, in Hudor. Um, so, just in terms of the the fragility uh, of what's on the ground, you know, how does the country and Amazon respond if Ethiopia does pull out and and we see increased um, uh, tension there. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Burnett from Human Rights Watch. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on on an important issue that I think gets neglected sometimes. You, you mentioned the importance of accountability for the military. We're obviously absolutely with you there. I'm wondering if you have thoughts or plans on developing Somalia's military justice system. It's obviously a problem in a lot of countries, including a lot of the countries working in Somalia. I can say on the Uganda side, it's not a system that should be borrowed from, you know, from Uganda. The Ugandan soldiers have their own problems of accountability. Um, so to the extent that uh, soldiers need to be held accountable for their actions, 
what are the plans to develop uh, Somalia's military justice system? Are there any real clear recommendations or, or plans? You know, the, the problem of, of uh, a lack of an appeal, for example, the lack of any uh, defense lawyers for those who are accused. I mean, there's problems both on the prosecution and on the defense side. Um, I was also curious your thoughts on uh, how to protect the justice institutions themselves, uh, you know, given that we just saw this horrific bombing a couple of weeks ago of the court structure and two of the sort of most well-known and prominent lawyers who had been doing human rights defense work were killed in that attack. Um, you know, developing these institutions is going to be is going to be very difficult if the buildings themselves are, are are targeted and the individuals who actually do have some capacity to help in this process are are targeted along the way. Thank you. investment and also uh, the, the return through transparency mechanisms coming into the Somali government coffers, which is one of the main reasons why, uh, not just to Somalia but across Africa, that the British Prime Minister David Cameron has made tax and transparency a key plank of the G8 agenda uh, in June this year. And that's to make sure that the communities that have these natural resources actually benefit from them. So there's transparency both in terms of the funding coming into the, uh, the national government structures, but also transparency in the, in the private sector uh, as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the question about refugees, well, of course, uh, absolutely right, stability and security is the prerequisite to give people the confidence to return back into parts of Somalia where they haven't been for many years. And you'll be aware, I'm sure, there's a significant number of displaced Somalis living in Kenya. Um, and certainly there is a, uh, a hope and aspiration that if stability can be secured, that uh, many of those people, Somalis will go back and, and return to, uh, to Somalia. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the troops, I think there is a, uh, certainly a commitment from Amazon, uh, as long as the funding can be uh, resolved, to assist in providing uh, security for as long as it is required. Um, but it's why the key emphasis that I tried to put in my remarks and one of the key factors to be focused on in the conference on May the 7th is ensuring that we expedite as far as possible security sector reform in Somalia. So the Somali government themselves can take responsibility for their territorial integrity, for the safety of their people and the protection of uh, property uh, as well. So that is going to be a main focus. And I think there needs to be significant international as well as regional cooperation and coordination to uh, make sure that that happens. And that ties in um, quite neatly with the third question, uh, which uh, absolutely right. Of course, the uh, all aspects of the justice system uh, in Somalia need to be reformed. I think you're um, being a little bit unkind in some of the uh, implications behind your question. There's quite a lot of effort put in by the international community in making sure that troops that are going into Somalia are trained, uh, whether it be through the EU training uh, mechanism or through other training structures, to make sure that troops understand the importance of respecting people, human rights, humanitarian law. Um, but again, you're absolutely right to make the point that there should be no uh, impunity, that if people do commit horrific crimes, they need to be held to account for, for doing so. Um, and certainly from the conversations that the UK government have had with the Somali government, there is a determination to make sure that those structures are put in place. Uh, David Shen, George Washington University. This is really more of a comment that perhaps you could uh, respond to. But in contacts with the uh, Somali diaspora in um, the Washington area, and as you know, the diaspora is in regular contact with their folks back in, in Somalia as a result of the excellent cell phone system, 
One of the concerns I'm hearing uh, is that the, the Sheikh Hassan government is spending so much time uh, sort of dealing with the international audience, and I don't mean to denigrate that at all. It's very important that there be international support for Somalia. But there's a disproportionate amount of his time and his administration's time dealing with the region and dealing with the international side that he's basically neglecting the need to build political support and a constituency in Somalia itself, and that that part of the equation is, um, is slipping and that time is running out, um, a feeling that he just hasn't succeeded in dealing with some of the internal schisms that have always existed there that he should be dealing with. And I'm just wondering if there's, if there's any way that the international community can sort of push him back to focus on the internal situation, which may even mean less international travel than he's been doing, and he's been doing a lot of it. Uh, you made a very good presentation. By the way, I'm from the Boston that we think is old and you think is new. Um, I also have just more of a comment than a question. Uh, I've been involved with Somalia off and on for about 30 or 40 years, and I was uh, chief of our mission there in the 93-94 period after Black Hawk Down. A couple of thoughts occurred to me. Your, your presentation is extremely ambitious, and good luck. I hope it works. I'm kind of glad the British are in the lead, because you're very strong diplomatically, and sometimes you can make people do things, like help Nigeria at the IMF, when they might not otherwise do so. And I say that because I, I'm a little concerned about, I guess the question is, how important is the US role because I'm a little worried that we'd be able to play as active a role as you may require. Um, there are so many demands on America's time at a time when the population seems to be more inward looking. We have budget problems, we have political problems. Um, um, there's another aspect of American activity in Africa and that is it's awfully hard to just pursue a program without our conflicting um, uh, objectives coming into play. Just to give you a specific example, uh, at one point with Chad, we had a very important uh, objective working with their military vis-a-vis -vis Darfur, which was a major crisis. On the human rights side, we were concerned about uh, Chadian military may be dealing inappropriately with women. And the net result was we couldn't get anywhere. We were totally hamstrung. The Human Rights Office said, if we don't push on this, we'll get criticized in Congress. But the net result was we couldn't do, we couldn't achieve our broader objectives. And I can't help but see that happening in Somalia. There are so many um, cross currents there that are gonna get in the way. And so my comment is it's gonna take an incredibly intense and enduring diplomatic effort. I don't even know if we have many Western <laughs> diplomatic missions in Mogadishu to maintain a continuing dialogue. I know for a long time it wasn't safe. I don't know if that's changed or not. So my comment is that um, in my mind, I congratulate you for the program you've outlined. It sounds very sensible to me, but I'm a little bit concerned that um, the realities of Somalia at a minimum are gonna delay what you're able to do. Uh, and so I hope you're in it for the long haul. And as an American, I just wonder if we'll be able to play the kind of strong role that you probably want from us. Yeah. So I address those two very good um, set of remarks, if I may. Um, I think we've got to understand, and I try to sort of allude to this in my remarks, the challenge which the president and his government in fa is facing in terms of the capacity that exists within the Somali government to deal both with interacting with the international community, but also dealing with the domestic challenges that you outlined and we, I, I talked about uh, as well. And I think that's why it's important to re-emphasize that the international community will have to be <laughs> supportive for some considerable time. And I suspect that uh, even when the president and his senior ministers are in Mogadishu, 
that they are under pressure to see visiting foreign dignitaries who want to talk to them about how they can assist building, uh, rebuilding Somalia. So certainly one of the first things that the UK government did, and we announced it at the UN General Assembly at La in New York last September, was uh, an initial £10 million to help the Somali government build government capacity to avail them to deal with some of these challenges that you quite rightly outline. But I, I absolutely agree with you that it's very important that the president and his government engage, and he has been doing some of this. I mean, I don't think we should just suggest that he's been traveling internationally. He hasn't. He has gone out into some of the uh, more rural parts of Somalia to talk to Soma what I call normal, ordinary Somali people. Uh, which, from what I understand, is the first time in certainly living memory that any senior Somali politician has actually uh, done this. But there is also an importance that he engages and builds strong and lasting relationships with countries and senior political figures in the region as well to ensure that there's a commonality of purpose from the whole international community, not just those of us in the UK um, and, and in the US. And I'm pretty certain that he's very conscious of the importance and the necessity uh, to do that. In terms of the engagement going forward of the international community, yes, the UK is committed uh, in an ongoing way. Yes, I very strongly believe that the US has a very significant role to play, not just in participating as uh, a another player in the international community, but as the, uh, the strongest richest country on the planet, it is important that the US engages in assisting probably the or one of the weakest countries on the planet to help it rebuild itself. Aside from the important domestic security issues that both the US and the UK have, potentially if Somalia were to go very seriously wrong again. So I think there's an inherent interest, not just morally, but also practically uh, as well. And you're right, uh, Ambassador, to point out the fact that the agenda is very ambitious. It is ambitious, and David Cameron is determined to maintain that ambition, because I think there's a feeling that if we remain static, we don't continue aligning the priorities with the Somali government's priorities to drive forward the agenda, then the, the, the situation is more likely to go backwards than it is to go forward. So I think ambition is absolutely right. In terms of the comments that you make about uh, interesting comparison to what happened in Darfur and sexual violence, uh, it's been one of the main priorities of my boss, the Foreign Secretary William Hague, to put in place an international consensus around preventing sexual violence in conflict. And it's not just relevant to Somalia, it's relevant to Mali, Eastern DRC, increasingly in Syria uh, as well. And there was a significant, a major step forward at the foreign minister's meeting at the G8 and making it part of the, um, the Geneva Convention. So I'm hoping that the, we're hopeful that the, set, the problems that you quite rightly outlined existed, that existed 10 years ago in Darfur, won't exist again because of the priority that the international community has given to this very, very uh, important area, using, for example, rape as a weapon of war. And all too often, people have been able to get away with it. So uh, yes, the US is a very important ally, and I think has a very significant contribution to make, both in terms of helping with the security and stability, but also assisting with economic development and economic growth going forward as well. Before I turn to Doug, uh, just to, f to follow on that, I wonder who, who are you thinking beyond the G8 countries who may be big players in this? We hear a lot about Turkey's engagement and how they're doing it, not just kind of what they're giving, but that they're directly engaged. Um, I wonder if in the, in the Saudi Peninsula, I wonder if China, is, is, is China playing a role in, in this conference? Are there, are there kind of the non-traditional donor community any kind of promising uh, uh, people's uh, countries stepping up there as well? Uh, yes, I mean, you're right that uh, Turkey are playing a very significant role. Um, they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, held a meeting, uh, hosted a meeting last week between the two respective presidents. They've drawn up a, an initial security sector reform plan uh, in, con in consultation. There'll be a, a key component of the security sector reform debates that take place uh, in the conference in London. The countries in the Gulf also have a significant role to play uh, as well. 
uh, whether it be the UAE or Qatar, in uh, providing uh, additional finance, whether it be for security sector reform, economic development, uh, or police uh, reform as well. And I think one of the key challenges for the international community will be to coordinate this effort, to make sure that there isn't duplication, that there isn't uh, a, uh, a waste of resourcing, and that we get the maximum impact on the ground in the shortest possible uh, time scale. The other countries that, of course, I think have a major significant role to play are those in the immediate vicinity. So it's Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Djibouti, uh, and not just in terms of providing security, as they have done very successfully uh, to date, the significant progress that's been made, but also over time helping with the development of the uh, economy. And certainly one of the main facets that Africa rightly is beginning to focus on but hasn't had sufficient progress, in my view, in the past, is on intra-regional African trade, i.e. trading with each other rather than relying on trade coming from uh, the outside. And I think that should be a major focus going forward, not just in the Horn of Africa but across the African continent. Thank you. And, okay, we'll uh, Doug. Hi, Doug Brooks, uh, independent consultant. Um, you may have seen the movie recently that just came out, the documentary on the uh, Puntland Maritime uh, Police Force uh, called The Project, uh, which by all accounts, or by many accounts, I should say, has done quite a bit to curtail the, uh, the piracy issue. Uh, there had been some discussion that the, uh, the PMPF was going to be uh, integrated into the larger uh, Somalia um, security forces. Uh, is, has there been any movement on that? Hello, I'm Al Ali. I'm at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Um, I was wondering, um, so you, you, you mentioned that uh, the British government is engaging with the Somali diaspora, both the Somali diaspora and the Somaliland diaspora. And I was wondering um, what efforts you were making in engaging with uh, the younger Somali generation in, in, in Britain. Um, you've seen uh, a growth of uh, organizations in, in, in England that, you know, have uh, both inspired those who were born in England to kind of be aware of the issues in Somalia, but you've, you've also seen them present in Somalia, whether that is opening art exhibitions in Hargeisa or, um, in, you know, educating women about uh, the dangers of FGM. Somalia is rebuilding its itself, um, you know, with the help of international organization and with the current government in place. Um, and these young, uh, the younger generation are a product of globalization and, you know, came of age in a, in a world in which technology is at its height. Um, they have fresh voices, they have fresh views on issues, and I think they could, um, I think they could be very instrumental in Somalia's goal. I'm just wondering, what the British government was doing in, in terms of engaging with the, 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 younger, the younger parts. and intelligence sharing. The setting up of RAPIC, which is a, a monitoring um, base uh, and um, a coordinating uh, gr a group uh, on the Seychelles, where there is much more coordinate, coordination about following the money, making sure that pirates are, when they're caught, are tried, and there's a rule of law process uh, that takes place as well. But ultimately, the solution to piracy is on the land, not on the sea. And the st creating stability and economic development, removing the traction or the, 
the facets that exist to encourage people to go into piracy will, it will ultimately be the way that the, we, we resolve this in, in a lasting way. In terms of the specific that you asked, that is still being worked on. I don't want to really go into any more, any more than that at, at the moment. In terms of the question at the back that the young lady raised, I absolutely and totally agree with you. The, the, and certainly in the, the engagement that I've had with young people in the UK, which are part of the Somali diaspora, they are uh, extremely engaged, have a lot of very uh, bright ideas, don't necessarily always agree with their elders, which is quite interesting, um, and I think believe they have a significant role to play in rebuilding uh, Somalia, not just in sending remittances back, but in taking a very active, proactive role uh, in doing so. And if there's one thing that struck me about engaging with the UK young Somali diaspora is the extraordinary level of ambition that exists, both in terms of wanting to drive economic development, but also making a personal contribution. And I think as stability sets in, the security aspect continues to improve, that we all hope will be the case. I'm very optimistic that actually the younger Somali diaspora, both in the UK, but hopefully here in the US as well, will take an even more proactive role than they're already starting thinking about. Somaliland, sorry, the, the question at the end. Uh, I mean, the UK's government on Somaliland is uh, quite clear. We, um, we understand their aspiration, but we believe it's a matter for the Somali and Somaliland people to resolve. Um, and uh, as I said uh, in my remarks, the discussions have begun. Um, I don't think that it's, the discussions are always going to be easy, but it's important they reach a satisfactory conclusion. And we also think that it's important that they begin their discussions on the areas where there are mutual interests. And security and economic ties are two obvious ones. We are at time. Um, Already? Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, thank you so much uh, for the presentation and for the questions and answers. Um, I wish you the best of luck with the, with the conference itself, but also kind of the sideline conferences that are going to be so important. And the idea of just building momentum as the subsequent, the Tokyo conference, the G8 comes forward. Um, you know, I think it's incumbent on us to be making the case to the United States that given everything that's been invested in Somalia over time, I mean, we, ha we have to work up and find the stomach to, to kind of stick with this uh, longer. Um, it, there's, you know, we have a new Secretary of State uh, in place. He's obviously got a lot of, from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there is, I think, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of rhetoric on building institutions and so forth. I think uh, in terms of finding a long, sustainable solution to Somalia, um, we're all here to try to make that case, I think. Um, and there is this narrow window of opportunity that we don't want to see close um, soon. So I think all of us here will be working towards that end. And uh, we wish you luck, and we'll look forward to the outcome of London um, in the next month. Thank so thanks very much for joining